Hi, welcome back. Here we are after spring break. Your mind should be free and clear and rested and ready to just jump right back in because it's not going to be long before we get to the end of the semester. So let's get our thinking caps back on and we're going to start with the elbow, wrist, and hand. All right. So as always, I'm going to be following along with the notes, so it's always helpful to have those in front of you. As you can see, we start with some main characteristics of the elbow, wrist, and hand. So let's first talk about the elbow. This makes sense because we talked about the shoulder previously, so now we're just moving distally to the elbow. So when we talked about the shoulder, just to remind you, we said that the shoulder doesn't have very strong bony congruency. It has so-so ligaments. So as a result, the shoulder has to rely on muscles for most of its stability. And of course, you remember the muscles that we talked about that give the shoulder most of its stability are the rotator cuff muscles. So with each joint, we're going to talk about what gives that joint most of its stability. So, being the good teacher that I am, we are reviewing. So, what gives the shoulder most of its stability? Muscles. And what muscles were they? I can hear you saying them. And not only do you know that they're called the rotator cuff muscles, you know them as the sits muscles and you know what they are. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis, of course. So, here we come to the elbow. So what's going to give the elbow most of its stability? And when it comes to the elbow, about half of its stability comes from the bony structures. And you know by now, if I'm writing something down, you should definitely know it. And the remaining half comes from ligaments. So here at the elbow, we've got a half and half situation. Really, it's equally spread out in terms of where the elbow gets most of its stability. Half of it comes from the bony structures, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And then it also has pretty strong ligamentous support. When we get to the wrist, we're going to talk about the wrist later. As you can see in your notes there, it's a much more complicated joint. We got those eight carpal bones, and we'll talk about how those fit together in addition to how the carpal bones fit in with the forearm bones and then the bones of the hand. Um, it's much more complicated, but we'll talk about that later. Let's jump right into the elbow. The elbow itself is known as the humeral ulnar joint. The wonderful thing about these joints is that they're named for the bones they connect. So in this picture, can't we see the main elbow joint is the trochlea of the humerus and the trochlear notch of the ulna. So it's the humeral ulnar joint, joint between the humerus, you really can't see that now can you, joint between the humerus and the ulna. What you notice is that it's not necessarily between the ulna, excuse me, the radius and the humerus. See that space there? So the elbow joint is between the humerus and the ulna. Therefore, it's called the humeral ulnar joint. But you see, as this is a more advanced course, 300 level, not only do you need to know that it's between the humerus and the ulna, I'm going to ask you to know the specific articulating surfaces. So. The beauty of this is that you hopefully will remember some of this from your anatomy and physiology. The articulating surfaces are the trochlea of the humerus fitting into the trochlear notch of the ulna. Is there a trochlear notch on the ulna here? Let's see. This is a better picture, actually. So this here, I'm going to color it. It's actually the blue surfaces. I don't even need to do any coloring. This here is the trochlea of the humerus. So the articulating surfaces of the elbow joint. We know the elbow joint is the humerus and the ulna. 
but more specifically, it's the trochlea of the humerus. When I teach this in AMP, the trochlea, it almost looks like a, a spool when thread comes on, or some people say it looks like a bow tie, which is to say that it's kind of larger on the outside, like a bow tie, and then narrower in the middle. Bow tie. But the inside of it is that concave surface, and that's going to fit perfectly into the trochlear notch of the ulna. When I teach A and P, I talk about the trochlear notch looking like an ice cream scoop. If you look at a side view of the ulna, most of the bone is flat, but then the very end of it kind of looks like that. Ice cream scoop, some people think it looks like a pipe. You know, I don't, I don't do such things, um, so I, I wouldn't have any knowledge of pipes or any of that paraphernalia. Okay, so the articulating surface of the humeral ulnar or radial joint would be the trochlea of the humerus, which is concave, dips in a little bit, fitting into the trochlear notch of the ulna which is convex, so they fit very well together. This is a hinge joint. Yes, indeedy. This is our example of a hinge joint. We talked about it in the articulations chapter. <laughs> I mean, you can guess what I'm about to say here. See how it all comes together, right? <laughs> You're probably so tired of hearing that. This is our example of a true hinge joint. Uh, if you look at this little schematic here, if you turn that on its side, it does look like hinges of a door. That kind of gives you an idea that the elbow can simply only flex and extend. That is it. We did talk about the elbow, or excuse me, the knee. The knee is a modified hinge joint because the knee is able to do a little bit of rotation, but the elbow is our true hinge joint. The motions that are allowed at the elbow are flexion and extension. Just like a door can only open or close, the elbow can only flex and extend. It, there can be some hyperextension. So in some people with looser ligaments and joint capsules, they can actually hyperextend. They can go a little bit beyond that zero. But this motion is still happening in a linear fashion. Flexion and or extension, that's about it. It may look like the elbow is rotating, but that rotation is actually happening at the shoulder. Because if you look at the articulating surfaces, this is not going to be surfaces that allow for rotation. It's simply flexion and extension. What about the closed pack position? So hopefully you're going to start to see a trend here because for each joint, and that's what we're going to spend the rest of the semester going through, we're going to go through the same pattern here. We'll talk about the general anatomy. What are the two bones that make up the joint? What are the specific joint surfaces that make up the joint? What kind of joint is it? What kind of motions are allowed? And then what is the closed pack position of each joint? So the closed pack position of the elbow is extension. And remember, closed pack means when there is most bone on bone, the position where there is the most bone on bone contact, and therefore it is the most stable. So pretty much in full extension. Some may argue it's a couple degrees short of full extension. But pretty much full extension is when the joint is most stable because there is the most bone on bone. Do you see how I am repeating things? That's because they're important. Okay. If you follow along in your notes, you can see there, uh, number five, of course the elbow is going to work in concert with movements at the shoulder and wrist. None of these joints work in isolation. Okay. So that was a big discussion on, I suppose semi-big, on the humeral ulnar or the elbow joint. So let's go back and talk a little bit about 
if you look in your notes, you can see humeroradial joint. Now, this is not the true elbow. The true elbow is the humeral ulnar joint because it is these joint surfaces that are articulating humeral ulnar. But what about the humerus and the radius? Do they ever touch? And the answer is yes, only at certain ranges of motion. So let's talk about this. The humeroradial joint. Humeroradial joint. This is only going to have a joint, so these bones only touch or articulate in certain ranges of motion. So that's why it's not the true elbow joint. Basically, when we get to a certain degree of flexion, pretty significant amount of flexion, there will be some touching of these joint surfaces. What are those articulating surfaces? Joint formed by, technically it's the capitulum of the humerus, but we're just going to say humerus. See, I give you a break sometimes. Articulating surfaces would be the end of the humerus and the head of the radius. So we'll just be a little bit more general on this one. The articulating surfaces when these bones touch, which is not often, when these bones touch end of the humerus and the head of the radius. What type of joint is this? This is considered to be a gliding joint, which tells us that there's only a little bit of motion. Dare I say, a gliding motion. So when we talk about movements allowed, um, it doesn't really specifically get its own type of movement. So we don't, in gliding joints, we don't say flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, etc. We tend to just say a little bit of gliding, and that can assist the true elbow joint. So that gliding is there to assist the true elbow joint. E apostrophe is just shorthand for elbow. So that little bit of touching that happens between the humerus and the radius when we're in flexion of the elbow is there to only glide a little and it assists the true elbow or humero ulnar joint. All right. See us moving right along? Okay. Let's talk about the proximal radio ulnar joint. Let's see. Okay. I got all kind of pictures here. We got some x-rays so you can see the humeral ulnar joint and then the humeral radial space that happens. It's kind of cool. We can see that when the elbow is flexed, use the red here, when the elbow is flexed, the space between the radius and the humerus narrows and there's some touching versus when there's extension, there's a space and no touching there. This is probably the best picture, too, on the right, to talk about the proximal radial ulnar joint. Proximal tells us it's closer to the point of attachment. So in other words, we're talking about a joint between the radius and the ulna closest to the elbow. Proximal. Radio ulnar joint. Lovely. The name of the joint tells us what bones we're talking about. The joint between the radius and the ulna, closest to the elbow. So the joint is formed by the radius and the ulna. If you want to be specific, let's be specific the radial tuberosity. So it is the joint between the radial tuberosity of the radius. Let's see if it shows it on here. Radial tuberosity. See? Tuberosity of radius. It's a big bump. 
it fits into a little groove in the ulna. So we're not going to worry about that groove. I'm trying to pick and choose. I'm not going to ask you to know everything. So it's the joint between the radial tuberosity of the radius and a little groove in the ulna. Or a little depression. But once again, we have a convex and a concave surface. So the radial tuberosity is convex, rounded, fitting into a concave or depressed surface in the ulna. That groove is actually called the radial notch. You don't have to know that. But if you're wondering, it's radial. Oh, actually, let me make sure I correct myself here. The radial notch is actually up here. But let's just, leave, let's keep it simple. Let's say that this joint is between the radial tuberosity and this groove in the ulna. There is also some articulating up here where the head of the radius fits into the ulna. So there's kind of, kind of two articulation points. We're choosing to focus on this one, this articulation point. However, when they move, it forms a pivot joint. And of course, both points of articulation are going to move. The head of the radius and the radial tuberosity. They simply pivot over the ulna. Really important to point out here, it is the radius who, who moves or pivots. The radius is the bone that moves over the ulna. This is our best example of a pivot joint. It's wonderful. Pretty cool. Pivots. It is the radius that moves over the ulna. And of course, this is going to give our motions of pronation and supination. We tend to consider these happening at the forearm. The forearm are the bones that are moving, the radius and the ulna. The radius, technically. Pronation is to pivot this joint to move so your palms are down. We already discussed this. It's just a review. Pronation to pivot the radius over the ulna so that the palm is facing down. Pronation. Supination would be to pivot the radius over the ulna so that the palm is facing up. And guess what? There is even a closed pack position of this joint. I mean, this is a synovial joint, folks. That means it has a joint capsule, surrounding ligaments, synovial fluid. It's got the whole, the whole shebang. The closed pack position, when there's the most bone on bone, is about, I'm going to put an approximate sign, about five degrees of supination. I can review this when we meet in person next on Thursday. If you imagine neutral, so further proximal radial ulna joint, neutral, is when you have your thumb facing up towards the sky. From that, you can do, you can pronate so your palm faces down, and you can supinate so your palm faces up. So from that neutral position where your hand is positioned so that the, your thumb is pointing towards the sky, you supinate about five degrees. That's the position where there's the most bone-on-bone -bone contact. Fantastic. Okay. We can see the contact points in this picture. So you can see that a lot of the contact happens here between the head of the radius and the radial notch in the ulna. That's the same thing happening here. And there's also going to be a certain degree of touching between the radial tuberosity and the groove in the ulna. All right, you can see, following in your notes, next thing here is something called the carry angle. It's kind of one of those things that if you just look at someone, 
you know that it's there. Um, but we actually give it a name, and it's not super complicated. What this is saying that when you are standing, facing forward, arms at your side, there tends to be a bit of a lateral angle there. Instead of your arm just being able to hang down straight, there tends to be a little bit of a lateral angle of the forearm, where instead of being straight down, which is what this picture on the right is showing you, and let me highlight it, instead of the angle going straight down, it goes a little bit to the side. So we can measure that angle. The average carry angle, the average amount that it goes lateral is about 10 to 15 degrees in adults in the lateral direction. You should know this, the lateral degree that the forearm moves laterally relative to the humerus. It tends to be a little bit higher in women than men, maybe because women have larger hips. So because women have larger hips here, they tend to hold their arm a little bit out more to the side. Interestingly enough, I mean, I, I'm not aware of a specific anatomical explanation other than to say that maybe in evolutionary terms, it helps us carry stuff. You know, if you're carrying a bag of groceries or I'm talking about caveman times, if you're carrying berries or prey that you just killed to feed the family, um, it behooves us to to move our forearm a little bit to the side. Otherwise, the thing that we carry would keep hitting our leg. So I think that's really the functional significance, whether it's an evolutionary thing or whether it was there from the beginning. But we just want to identify that it exists. Okay. So we're going to next talk about the supporting structures. So, so far, we've talked about the humeral ulnar joint, which is our true elbow joint. We've talked about the humeral radial joint, that the humerus and the radius touch only in certain ranges of motion. And we've talked about the proximal radial ulnar joint. So what's interesting, at least I think so, you may not think so, but I think so, there's a joint capsule that tends to encapsulate all three. I'm getting so excited, I just had a little spit come off and I wipe it off there. I'm not afraid to share. So we have a joint capsule that tends to enclose all three joints. Even though the primary joint here, where we have most of our emotion, is the humeral ulnar joint. We have a nearby humeral radial joint where the bones touch at certain ranges of motion and the proximal radial ulnar joint. This combined joint capsule is relatively loose and weak. I'm just saying if we compare joint capsule strength to other joints, this one is a little bit looser. But it's kind of okay because we have the strength of the bony congruency and the ligaments. Remember, we began this whole lecture by talking about how does the elbow, we're not going to talking about the elbow in greater detail here, the elbow gets most of its stability half and half. Half from the bony structures and half from the ligaments. So the fact that the joint capsule is a little bit looser is made up for by the strength of the bony congruency and the ligaments. Let's talk about some ligaments. Yes, we know that ligaments connect bone to bone. So let's look at the ligaments of the elbow joint, which we remember the true elbow is the humero ulnar joint. The more we say it, the more you say it when you're studying out loud, the better off you're going to be. We have radial collateral ligaments and ulnar collateral ligaments. 
Collateral ligaments tend to run on the side. You're probably more familiar with these in the knee joint, which we haven't gotten to yet. But if I draw the knee joint, there's the femur fitting into the tibia. Let's pick a different color here. So in the knee joint, the collateral ligaments are on the side, your medial collateral, lateral collateral, versus in the knee joint, the cruciates are in the middle, but collateral means on the side. So it's no different here in the humeral ulnar or elbow joint. We have the ulnaral collateral ligaments. These would be on the medial side. And we have the radial collateral ligaments, which are on the lateral side. So let's start there. You may have heard the ulnar collateral being called the UCL, ulnar collateral ligament, and the radial collateral ligament being the RCL. Some people would rather per would choose to talk about these as medial lateral collaterals. But I think ulnar and radial are commonly used as well. So collateral ligaments run on the side. Let's first look at the radial collateral ligaments. So now we can see how it just runs between the lateral side of the humerus, which would be the lateral epicondyle. Let's see, lateral epicondyle is right here. So it runs from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus down to the radial head. You don't have to know those specific things. But what I do want to introduce here are valgus and varus. Let me just check ahead. Do I have, let's see. We got a bunch of other pictures here to help you. Okay. Let's talk about a valgus and a varus force. Which picture am I going to be able to best use this with? Sorry to keep going back and forth. My apologies. You know what? <laughs> I'm going to draw, which means you better watch out. So I've got a blank picture here. Okay. Let's draw a person. This is going to get scary, folks. <laughs> look at my person. All right. Let's look at this person's right. This is the person's right. That's their left, right? Correct? Yes. Okay. So we're going to draw the humerus, humeral head, kind of comes down. There's the humerus. Humerus. Lovely drawing I've got here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> what is the medial bone? The ulna. So I'm going to draw my ulna. That's the medial bone, ulna. And the lateral bone in anatomical position is the radius. Really bad drawer here. Okay. So we're going to introduce some terms here. Let me use a different color, blue. We're going to introduce two different types of forces. So we have a valgus force, V-A-L-G-U-S, valgus force, and a varus force. So here we get into some real kinesiology. Yes. A valgus force is a force from the lateral direction. To see how I can best say this. Force from lateral direction. So this is going to help us understand injury risk for these ligaments. 
So let's go back here. We know that we have the radial collateral and the ulnar collateral. Let's add those to the picture here. Let me put those in green. So we have the, this would be the ulnar collateral ligament. We'll do, we'll do two different colors here. The ulnar collateral ligament is in green. So we can read it here. Ulnar collateral ligament is in green. What color can I pick for the radial collateral? How about orange? The radial collateral ligament is in orange. Okay. When we have a valgus force, a force from the outside, and what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to bring in a model of the elbow into a lecture when we meet in person, and you'll be out, you'll be better able to see these. So that's coming. But see if you can understand it here as well. When we have a force from the lateral direction, if you have a force from the outside, you might get a bruise to the radial side. But if we have a lateral force, it's going to stretch the ulnar collateral ligament. That lateral force is going to kind of, if we talk about the segment as the humerus and then the radius and the ulna, a lateral or valgus force has the effect of this. That force would stretch out a medial ligament. See how the line here is more straight, but here it kind of does that. Therefore, it's going to stretch that ulnar collateral ligament. So a valgus force, a force to a body part or segment from the lateral direction, will stress medial ligament structures. So in this case, it's going to potentially stress or injure the UCL. And again, it'll be easier when we have the models, but if you can just bear with me. Let's talk about a varus force. So a varus force, varus would be a force from the medial direction. So this time, I would draw my force this way. A varus force is less common. It's just less common to have a force from the medial direction because your body's there. It's much more common to have a force. You know, if someone gets tackled, they're going to get tackled from here, and that's going to create more of a valgus force. So a varus force is typically less common. If I draw my segments again, meaning this is the humerus, ulna, and radius, a varus force... Would, let me see, I gotta really think about this here. A varus force is gonna stress the lateral ligaments because it would tend to do this. So it would stress more of the lateral ligaments because the force is coming from this way. So a varus force is gonna stress or injure the lateral ligaments ligaments. In this case, that would be the radial collateral ligament. Okay, we're going to talk about these much more. Um, but in our discussion of ligaments, let's first talk about the radial collateral ligament. Let's get back to the red here. So radial collateral ligament, it is on the lateral side of the elbow. Runs from the humerus to the radius.
and it is going to stabilize or protect against various forces. Varus, B-A-R-U-S, force, or force from the medial side. And this is more rarely injured because it's much more, it's much less common to have force from the medial side. Now, let's compare that to the ulnar collateral ligament. So let's talk about the ulnar collateral ligament. It's on the medial side of the joint. These ligaments run from the humerus to the ulna. It's going to stabilize, protect against valgus forces. And it's more commonly injured because it's much more common to have a valgus or force from the outside. When we look specifically at the ulnar collateral ligament, it has three bands. And you can see, even in this picture, we can see one band there and one band there. If we look more closely, it has three bands, anterior, posterior, and transverse. I would like you to know these three bands. This is a look from the medial aspect of the humeral ulnar joint. So we can see these three bands, anterior, posterior, and transverse. What are some things to know? The anterior bundle is our strongest. Strongest of the three. If you want to know more about it, the anterior bundle is more likely to provide stability in flexion and extension motions. The posterior portion gives us more strength when the elbow is flexed. The transverse doesn't really cross the elbow joint. Do you notice the transverse? It goes from one side of the ulna to another. So that's pretty interesting. So it doesn't really cross the elbow joint, which is pretty interesting. So instead of Instead of providing stability from valgus forces, the transverse bundle is more of a connector. It just helps to hold things together, so it's less of a stabilizer and more of a connector, whereas these two are going to be more of our stabilizers against those valgus forces. Interestingly, the ulnar collateral ligament is stronger than the radial collateral ligament. However, it's still more commonly injured, mostly because uh, it's just more common to have a valgus force. Okay, we're almost done with this first video. I want to finish with the elbow. So we'll finish these last couple things up until the wrist, and we'll continue that when we meet in person. So we've talked about the ulnar collateral ligament and the radial collateral ligament. But there is also a ligament called the annular ligament. I like this ligament, it's kind of cool. Let's talk about the annular ligament. This runs from radius to radius. <laughs> it attaches on one side of the radius, goes over the head of the radius, and crosses on the other side. So it runs from radius to radius, one side to another. Its job is to really stabilize or hold in place the head of the radius. Because remember, this is where we have a lot of motion at that pivot joint of the proximal radio ulnar joint. So when the radius pivots over top the ulna, the annular ligament is gonna help keep that head of the radius in place. That's really important. And actually I'll show you uh, this week when we meet, you know, you can actually feel that head of the radius 
pivoting back and forth when you pronate and supinate. Okay, we also have something called an interosseous membrane, which is just a sheath of connective tissue goes between the radius and the ulna. So it's not, it's not technically a ligament. It doesn't have that thick, dense, regular connective tissue with thick bands of collagen. So it's not as strong as a ligament, but it still plays a role here in helping to keep the radius and ulna together. Additionally, that interosseous membrane is an attachment site for some of the forearm muscles. So two functions, hold the radius and ulna together, attachment site for muscles. Hold radius and ulna together, attachment site for muscles, thin connective tissue sheath. All right, last piece of anatomical business in and around the elbow joint is the ulnar nerve. How could we not talk about that? Okay, so what do we see here? Well, here we have a medial view of the humeral ulnar joint. I can tell it's a medial view because I'm seeing the ulnar nerve. So the ulnar nerve runs between a couple key bony structures. The ulnar nerve is the yellow thing, right? Yellow thing. You can identify its position when we're palpating because it is felt between the olecranon process. We're going to practice these in lab. The olecranon process is the tip of the elbow. And the medial epicondyle of the humerus. So it's the olecranon process of the ulna and the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Those are our bony landmarks. Once you feel those two, we know right in between, and we're looking at a medial view here, is the ulnar nerve. The blue thing we're here looking at here are veins. We're not going to focus on veins. The ulnar nerve, it just happens to be, so the ulnar nerve is the yellow thing. Let's make sure I label this. Nerves are generally colored yellow. It just, it kind of is in a precarious position. So, you know, a lot of times we're not going to even worry about nerves. We know they're important. But this one happens to be in a precarious position. When you have injury, so... If we're looking at the medial side, we're obviously looking where the ulnar collateral ligament bands are, ulnar collateral ligament, right? So these whiter bands are the ulnar collateral ligament. When you have an injury to the ulnar collateral ligament, a lot of times the ulnar nerve, it just gets in the way and you can have complications. So particularly, if you had surgery to repair a torn ulnar collateral ligament, for our baseball fans, otherwise known as Tommy John surgery, which we'll discuss later, but the ulnar nerve, it just becomes a bit of a pest because it's right there in the way. So a lot of times they'll do something called an ulnar nerve transposition. When they go in, to replace a torn ligament here, they've got to kind of move the ulnar nerve out of the way, literally, physically move it out of the way in order to repair the ligaments and then kind of bring it back. So it just tends to be, I'm just pointing it out because it's in a precarious position and it tends to get injured or have a lot of complications just because of its location. By the way, it's also the quote unquote funny bone. So if you hit the inside of your elbow, and you have that numbness or tingling, um, you're hitting this nerve. So it's quite superficial also. All right, great, my friends. That ends this first video back from spring break. I will see you back for lecture and lab with a smile on our faces. Um, and of course, you will have watched this video by then and we'll be much better able to finish our discussion. All right, see you then.